Great, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm here to kick off the second session of the Hauser Symposium. My name is Kelly Myman hawk I am with McClarty Associates, and uh, our session here today is Brazil on the international stage in the age of geopolitics. We have a stellar panel here today. Um, I'll very quickly introduce them because uh, each of you have their bios, but we're joined on the screen um, by Oliver Stunkel, who's uh, Associate Professor of uh, International Relations at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Also on the screen from Washington, Bruna Santos, who's the Director of the Brazil Institute at the Wilson Center. Here in New York, to my left, Brian Winter, Editor-in-Chief of America's Quarterly. And to his left, Ricardo Zuniga, founding partner of Dinamica Americas and a former foreign service officer with the U.S. Department of State, where he worked a lot on Brazil. <laughs> um, I'm going to dive right into the conversation here today. Uh, Oliver, I thought that we would start with you um, with a bit of historical grounding. Um, I think that one of the paradoxes that we see with Brazil is that it's been a very active participant in the world of geopolitics, be it in the UN, be it in the WTO, be it in uh, multilateral financial institutions. Former panel talked a little bit about the G20, et cetera. But at the same time, Brazil has maintained a fairly consistent uh, non-interventionist philosophy. These might seem a little bit contradictory. And I was wondering if you might just walk us through the origins of this positioning and how does Brazil balance those seemingly contradictory approaches? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, discussion. I think broadly speaking, from Brazil's perspective, of course, these two uh, issues you describe uh, do not stand in tension, of course. Now, I'm not defending that personally, but I'll uh, share a bit about sort of Brazil's position uh, on that. I think Brazil considers uh, itself to be a staunch supporter of international law and rule ba rules-based order, Parking all the way back to the Second Hague Conference of uh, 1907, where developing countries in the Global South uh, was uh, crucial to uh, defending tree-based uh, multilateral uh, corporations. So Brazil is, I think, and has always been a defender of a rules-based international order, defender of multilateralism. And I think whenever Brazil diverges from the United States, it's not really that Brazil is against a rules-based order, but it um, often points out or it uh, rejects what it calls the selective application of rules and norms. So I think um, it's in that sense different from, let's say, a uh, country, uh, other countries uh, like Iran, for example, that is critical vis-a-vis uh, -vis the fundamentals of uh, international order. But Brazil, in that sense, is um, seeking to um, make adjustments or disagrees on very specific issues of how the rules and norms uh, should be applied. Uh, and even though, of course, it uh, oftentimes embraces a non-interventionist stance, it has actually actively intervened in other countries' affairs uh, over the course of the past decades, uh, be it uh, preserving democracy in 1996, for example, when it pressured a Paraguayan general not stage a coup, against a recently democratically elected uh, head of state, uh, but also more controversially, more recently, for example, when it supported the expulsion of Paraguay in 2012 uh, from Mercosur, even though there was no consensus whether democracy had actually been undermined. Um, there are, of, and which is, I think, uh, natural uh, from Brazil's uh, stance, the accusations of Western hypocrisy, but at the same time, it's also... Uh, important to mention that there are uh, oftentimes accusations against Brazil of acting in a hypocritical uh, uh, way, being critical of violations in some cases, but not in others. And that's, of course, because uh, Brazil, uh, as many other countries, pursues a pragmatic uh, foreign policy stance um, and one informed also by realpolitik. And when we look at the uh, current crisis in Ukraine, the invasion, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, then part of the reason why Brazil embraces a fence-sitting stance is because from a strategic point of view, um, Brazil would like to preserve its ties to Russia because it sees value in preserving uh, relations, strong relations to other BRICS countries in order to balance, uh, to some extent, uh, the United States. 
um, which is a, a longstanding security concern for Brazil, while not abandoning uh, productive relations uh, to the U.S. So I think uh, just to finalize, uh, Brazil seeks nowadays a stance or a strategy that could be described as non-aligned or multi-aligned. Uh, but uh, as geopolitical turbulence increases between the West on the one side and Russia and China on the other, I think that strategy will be increasingly challenging and will inevitably produce friction both uh, between Brazil and the West, but also occasionally between Brazil and its BRICS peers in the global south. Well, thank you, Oliver. And a follow-up question to that. I mean, if Brazil is taking a pragmatic approach, um, how is it in your mind that Brazil is deciding when or how to not necessarily intervene, but to speak out as you highlighted in some of the examples that you shared with us here today? Well, I think some of it is, uh, you know, uh, based on specific concrete interests. For example, Brazil depends on Russian fertilizers uh, and they are crucial for Brazilian agribusiness, which is important to maintain uh, Brazil's economic growth. So that is important to, to understand Brazil's position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but sometimes also domestic politics plays a role. So um, part of the Workers' Party um, is unhappy with what can be described as a largely uh, centrist economic policy. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, uh, celebrating the uh, quote unquote um, democratic legitimacy of the Maduro government or basically uh, making fun of the Venezuelan opposition is popular among part of the uh, of the electorate, the, the more most loyal sort of left wing uh, parts of the Workers Party, uh, which doesn't really um, you know, is is not really much yeah. more than than political uh, foreign policy rhetoric, but can to some extent be explained by a domestic political polarization. No, thank you, Brian. Off to you. I mean, how do you see this dynamic playing out in Brazil's leadership of the G twenty? The following year, they'll be leading COP. They've obviously been. I mean, Roberto Cavado used to run the WTO. Um, you know, how do you see them balancing kind of in concrete ways this kind of struggle between non-interventionism, but wanting to be involved, wanting to defend Brazil's interests? Yeah, well, thank you, CFR, for the invitation. Thank you, Kelly. Privilege to be here with Ricardo and the panelists who I know very well. Um, it's a tough balance. I mean, look, on the one side, Brazil has a very robust agenda for the G20 that caters well to Lula's personal strengths, as well as the institutional strengths of Brazil. They want to focus on combating poverty and hunger. That's an area where Lula and the PT specifically have a very compelling story to tell. Lula was one of 23 children born to uh, a father in, in Brazil's Northeast, um, was very poor growing up, came to Sao Paulo in the back of a truck uh, as a kid, lived in the back of a bar in a crowded room for four years, sold peanuts on the streets of Sao Paulo. And then once he was in office, it was a government that successfully, um, by their measures, eliminated hunger uh, and brought tens of millions of people out of poverty. So that's, for Brazil, that's, you know, that's a good agenda. Energy transition and sustainable development also there on the G20 agenda for them. That's another one where uh, even over the past year, uh, they have a good story to tell. Amazon deforestation, the rate has come down much faster than anyone expected. It's down 40%. Uh, that has been a huge surprise for me. And I know a lot of people who thought that that was going to take longer to turn around after the damage that we saw, um, starting actually at the end of the Dilma Rousseff years, continuing through Michel Temer, and then accelerating during Jair Bolsonaro's uh, presidency. Also, global governance reform is on uh, is a, a major topic for Brazil as part of the G20 process. As Oliver mentioned, um, that's consistent with their historic uh, appreciation for a rules-based order. This, of course, includes the subject of reform at the UN Security Council, which you know, good luck. Um, but they're 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 going to try. But in practice, you know, I think if we're honest. Some of this agenda has already been overshadowed in part by Lula's comments about um, Ukraine and more recently Israel and Gaza. And here I, I differ a bit with my friend Otaviano. 
uh, who said on the previous panel that it, it doesn't ma matter as much as the agenda. I respectfully think it does matter because it shows so much about these tensions that are in play in Brazil's foreign policy, especially in a government where I'm not sure Brazil is an exception on this front, but so much of the foreign policy is concentrated in two people, in Lula and his longtime foreign policy aides, also Amorim. Um, and, you know, the goal, as you mentioned, Kelly, is, is multipolarity or non-alignment. Um, but as someone said, I wish I could remember who, they said, um, non-alignment is a geometrical solution to a geopolitical problem. And in practice, it's actually very difficult. And while you can see Lula trying to sort of constantly strike that balance, it's very clear, and these comments that he's made provide insight into this, that his heart is always pulled in the direction of what you could call the global south. And those tensions are very present. Um, you know, some of this may be his age. I think he's at age 78, more attuned to some of the things that happened in the 20th century than he is in the more recent history of the 21st. I think this is someone who can talk to you at length about the sins, both real and perceived, of the United States in Brazil in the 20th century, but is perhaps less attuned to the fact that the country that has most recently invaded its neighbors in the 21st century is Russia, with whom they have a very positive um, relationship. I don't think Lula is anti-American, but I think his formative years were very much influenced by those experience of the coup of 1964 and other episodes in which the United States played a role. I also think he sees the world through the lens of class struggle, and that makes him sympathetic with the underdog or the, the, the group that he perceives as the underdog and very skeptical of anything associated with the West. Polling, it's interesting, polling shows that on some of this, he's a bit out of step with the Brazilian public. Um, this isn't the only poll, but the Pew Research Center does this occasional study of attitudes toward the United States around the world. And 63% of Brazilians have a positive view of the United States. 39% have a view, uh, a positive view on China. Uh, it's interesting that 63% number is higher than virtually any country in Western Europe, uh, which they generally are in the 50s. Argentina, for a point of comparison, is about 51. And it's the biggest gap between perceptions of US and China since 2010, which I think reflects a little bit some of the political changes that have taken place in the domestic politics that the previous panel was talking about. But look, final point here, I don't think Brazil is the only government that has these attitudes and these views that we're talking about. I think it's important not to lose sight of that. Most of Latin America and most Latin American governments are engaged in some version of non-alignment right now trying to strike a balance between the United States and China. Um, and, you know, as much energy was devoted to condemning Lula's most recent remarks, uh, comparing um, Israel's actions in Gaza to the Holocaust, I, I think it was important for members of the global community to, to condemn those remarks. But we shouldn't lose sight from an analytical point of view of the fact that actually those views are increasingly common throughout much of the global south. And they were echoed not only by the government of Bolivia, um, which is sort of less surprising, but also um, the president of Colombia. Uh, and so I think Lula, in some ways, is more reflective of these emerging viewpoints in the global south than we might expect. I think a lot of college campuses are grappling with that as well here in the yeah, United I mean, States, right? Shifts, it's not easy. It reflects shifts that are happening here too. Yeah, There's no, no doubt. it's not easy. Well, given everything you said, Brian, I mean, I thought it was interesting in the recent G20 meetings that, you know, poverty reduction, green energy, climate transition, and governance. It seemed like they focused more on governance, at least in the foreign minister's meeting. What do you attribute that to? And do you think that that's something where Brazil actually can move the needle, although maybe not on UN Security Council reform, as you noted. I mean, look, Brazil has a breathtakingly professional foreign service corps, and that is territory on which they are very comfortable. And I suspect, and here I, I speculate, um, which I think is always important to note, um, I suspect that they have been at some level either given that territory to play on 
or they know that that's an area where they can be active, as opposed to some of these other thornier and arguably more impactful questions. Mm -hmm. No, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Bruno, I'm going to pass to you now. Um, you know, as, as Brian was saying, a number of countries right now are trying to kind of bridge between China, the US. I think it's very interesting that in Lula 1.0, um, we saw him really latching on to the BRICS concept. I would note, as we sit here in New York City, a Goldman Sachs uh, invented concept, but he he latched onto it and, and really used that as a platform for how it was that Lula, President Lula was going to be inserting Brazil in a much more assertive way into the global stage. I mean, obviously, as being a leader of the global, global South was nothing new. I mean, having worked at USTR, and I remember well the WTO Cancun ministerial, where basically Brazil organized the global South to help to kind of you know give us a bit of a wake up call that we needed uh, we needed to shift our our priorities. Um, so well worn territory, uh, certainly for Brazil, but his leadership and and almost willing into existence the BRICS that was new, and you know I think that what we're seeing now, uh, obviously with the most recent, I think we can safely say China inspired BRICS expansion, um, has, has Lula kind of, you know, lost the thread here? Um, is this still a mechanism that Brazil can use to try to interact with the global South, to help to organize the global South, or has this become a totally different beast altogether? Thank you for your question and thank you for the invitation to be here. It's such a fantastic symposium. And I'm really humbled to be in this panel with uh, so many people that are admire and follow the work. And as a good Brazilian people that I fear not my friends yet, I want them to be my friends and also this great audience <laughs> that I know it's there. And uh, so, but just for me to just give a step back and say a few words about some of the things that my colleagues just said before jumping in bricks. Uh, I think that at the same time that Brazil's foreign policy seeks to assert a more active role in global debates where it has historically had very limited influence, including the conflicts in Ukraine and Gaza, it also wants, we see, to the, the, the domain to focus on domains where its expertise and impact are undisputed, such as, as you, you all have mentioned, uh, environmental conservation, food security, transition to renewable energy. Those are things that you cannot discuss without Brazil sitting at the table. So I think this is a strategy of, of adding up battles instead of picking the ones where we are better prepared to fight is a very delicate dance samba of diplomacy for Brazil. And I think that uh, it's very important to recognize and remember that the while balancing, balancing acts can be very strategic, they run the risk to be of, of being undermined by ideological forces. And the ideological forces in play right now in Brazil, <laughs> the same as in the US, are polarization. And we saw that in the, 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 the how strong the public opinion came out of the, the remarks uh, that Lula made about Hamas and um, the conflict in Gaza. So I think that for nations, and then starting to frame the conversation about the BRICS, I think that for nations like Brazil uh, in the Global South, adopting a stance of non-alignment and maintaining uh, this independence isn't just ideological, it's a, it's a calculated risk management strategy. Why do I say that? I think the, the this posture of independence has yielded Brazil tangible economic benefits. And that's something uh, Washington should understand better, in my opinion. Meaning that, uh, for example, last year, Brazil began exporting corn to China, stepping into a gap that was left by American producers and um, not only that, Brazil ascended uh, as the primary supplier of soybeans to China, uh, uh, usurping the position formerly held by the, the U.S. So I think that it's really clear whenever, um, whenever I'm in Sao Paulo and discussing with uh, the economic elites in the country, it's becoming more and more clear that for the first time we see business people in Faria Lima, which is Brazil's less charming Wall Street, 
uh, agreeing that Brazil's distance from major geopolitical conflicts and its tradition of non-alignment is in fact an asset to be leveraged economically. So about the BRICS and China and BRICS Plus, I think that it's important to notice that to Brazil, the US uh, dispute, the US rivalry is a competition happening between two fragile and independent superpowers. And in that unstable international system, or whenever I hear diplomats and foreign, the Brazilian, Brazil's foreign minister, they use a lot the word of uh, unstable for uh, international order. For Brazil, Brazil's foreign policy is now designed to manage the risk. As uh, Oliver said, the fence seating is a, a risk management uh, tactic for in, within this strategy. So on one side, Brazil is seeing in uh, China and its economic weakness becoming more and more clear, uh, the risks that all, the world is actually preparing if China um, China's growth decrease. And on the other side, Brazil and the world is seeing uh, the risks uh, that the American institutions democratic institutions are showing the world. So countries like Brazil are somehow mitigating, managing risk and waiting, literally, especially not drawing any conclusions until after the US coming election. So, and when we examine the BRICS, I think it's evident that Brazil in particular has become conscious of its diminished uh, influence following the group's expansion uh, an expansion that Brazil was resistant to and advocated against. But contrary, it's important to note that contrary to the notion that um, these nations under China's leadership are in Brazil itself are somehow orchestrating an alternative alternative global order, I think the reality is that somewhat um, it's uh, it's more accurate to suggest that this is um, this is a way for um, to make less radical transformation and more about designing a more selective way to leverage and modifying the ex existing structures of the system. So as we as we know, I think the current system, the current international framework, or the it, it's beneficial to China. So I don't see uh, these nations orchestrating necessarily uh, new organizations, but. Uh, new or a new order, but a new set of organizations, an alternate uh, set of organizations of quasi alliances of trade mechanisms of financial tools that um, somehow help them show uh, the other members, potential members, that the poss their possibility to tap into these emerging networks, seeking a more uh, fluid and ready access um, network of uh, a parallel structure where they see avenues that uh, are different than what is established now for international cooperation and development. So looking ahead and when we see what's next into 2024 and 2025 and what to expect of Lula's leadership under, um, especially in the presidency of G20 and COP, upcoming break summit in Russia. I think uh, Brazil wants to grow Brazil's um, economic power and influence without uh, relying too much on the usual rules set by the Western uh, countries. And these include making new deals and shining during the, the break summit in Russia. But I think an important step for us to look closely is, for example, what's the sign coming out of Lula joining OPEC Plus, which has caused some debate. I think that Lula argues that this move doesn't go against Brazil's effort to uh, be uh, environmentally friendly and uh, but out, but in in fact to uh, support those countries to do a green transition. So how that may play out is important for us to notice. And I think that just one final note, which is um, for me very uh, important uh, to note, is that uh, in an increasingly we are seeing a very increasingly fragmented global economy, right? And in this, in this environment, the non-aligned countries, which are mainly uh, emerging and developing countries, can deploy their economic and diplomatic um, power to keep the world integrated. And Brazil has one um, lever on, in all that, which I think we rarely debate in those forums, which, which is the digital lever. 
why do I say that? I think the the significance of Brazil's digital market to American companies uh, are it's huge. Brazil has a legacy of influence in UN forums and multilateral forums in terms of internet governance, influencing uh, uh, more cohesive uh, ways to discuss cybersecurity governance, for example. So I think the backdrop of uh, tech cold war is there we are and we are not talking about how the global south could be a way uh, could be an ally in helping the world to not not to be so fragmented in a way where there's no turning point in a way that we will uh, maybe not um disintegrate completely and maybe create um may, maybe create two different digital realms that we cannot go back to any sort of integration thank you bruna Ricardo, off to you. So we were just talking about the BRICS with Bruna. Understand that Brazil does part, uh, plan to participate, right, in the uh, BRICS uh, summit here at the end of the year in Russia. Um, it's going to be a balancing act, right, vis-a-vis -vis Brazil's relationships in Washington, vis-a-vis -vis Brazil's relationships in Europe. Um, you've got 30 plus years as a diplomat working on Brazil in a variety of different incarnations. How does the U.S. view this kind of hmm. multi-friend strategy, multi-alliance strategy that the Brazilians are taking? And how do you see this relationship evolving going forward? So thank you. Uh, and great discussion so far. And so I think one, uh, one of the beauties of working on this relationship as a U.S. diplomat is that because there are so many similarities between the United States and Brazil, and they also have this really incredible uh, diplomatic core and a, a global vision, this is the country from the Americas that we run into all over the world. Uh, it also, having that kind of relationship with Brazil, uh, gives a look at our own contradictions and the way that we approach the world. And when you see the contradictions in Brazilian foreign policy, you're able to very easily, more easily identify the ones in US policy. And I think that in terms of the relationship, I think I want to pick up a couple of things that Brian mentioned. First of all, when you're looking at the broad scope and the sweep of this relationship over time, the most important factor is the one that he mentioned about views of the United States and Brazil. And there is a reason why those views exist that goes beyond uh, uh, Netflix, although that's important. <laughs> Pro Professor Netflix is one of the most important English teachers in, the, in, in Brazil. Uh, but the thing is this, more Brazilians want to live in a world that looks like what Americans want to live in. And that, when you're talking about countries of Brazil's scale, is consequential. Values are consequential. They're beyond emotion. And one of the challenges in the relationship between the United States and Brazil, and it comes right down to, this, uh, to the events of this year, is that neither one has really fully understood the level of potential, the, not just the potential in the relationship, but the strengths of the other uh, and how they can help together kind of create a world that works for both countries. Instead, there is, there is still some difficulty, some looking back. And I think both Brazil and the United States are really struggling to stay ahead of this more fragmented economic order, much more fragmented geopolitical order, and many more changeable relationships. Mike Froman mentioned earlier, polygamy versus marriage. I think you mentioned earlier that Tom Shannon uh, said the U.S. wants to fall in love and get married, and, and Brazil has other views. They'd like to, you know, have other, other relationships. And I think that there's a lot of truth to it. But guess what? The world now is far too complex for you to set, uh, yeah, kind of set a, have a vision, a strategic vision uh, that you're going to be able to execute over, over decades. It's changing too fast. Uh, and coming to the BRICS, I think that's really fundamentally important because uh, I'm going to disagree a little bit with, with Bruna here because I think what she, what she described is the BRICS expansion as Brazil would like it to be, not as it is. Because I think the Brazil uh, uh, is experiencing a wake-up call just as the United States has about how complicated the world is. I mean, our wake-up call was the reaction of the world to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That was a tremendous wake-up call about what was happening in the global south. Brazil's wake-up call was... BRICS expansion, where it was isolated and left behind a, a Xi-led vision of the world, which is absolutely in conflict with the G7, and explicitly so, 
on the part of some members of that BRICS, the expanded BRICS. Definitely not Brazil. Brazil does not have that. End. That's not how they see it. They see it as Bruno described it. But that is now a minority vision. And for a leader of the global south like Brazil to be in an organization that is now really led and driven by, is China really the global south? It is not. And I mean, it's pretty clear. If, if, if they are competing with the IMF for indebtedness in the developing world uh, and, and for as a creditor of the developing world, then you have to ask, and I know that Brazil is asking this, what is their place uh, in this world? And I, I would just come back to this values being consequential component. Yes, pragmatism is, is the hallmark of Brazilian uh, diplomacy. And uh, flexibility also is an important hallmark and the world that's coming and the world that's emerging now is going to call on every bit of that. And I think that one trap that's existed with this government in particular uh, is that they have a vision of the world that's still early 2000s, and they've had to adapt very quickly to a very different uh, geopolitical scenario. I can tell you this, when we first met with Lula after, uh, right before he came into office, one of the points, and, and by the way, while all of the election mess was playing out, this is in December of 2022, uh, we said the Putin you're going to see is not the Putin you remember. And the Russia you remember is not the Russia that exists today. So I think we're all adjusting. The, the, the very strong connection between societies is going to continue to kind of create spaces for us to operate. And we are working very well on issues like climate change and energy. We're both uh, very focused on on climate and on sustainability, and at the same time that we're growing our oil industries. So, like, we're all these contradictions are very much a part of that relationship. Anyway, I'll stop there. Just two quick follow up questions: If BRICS expansion was a wake up call for Brazil, and if we're going through our own realization adjustments here in the United States, can Brazil be a bit of kind of a global South whisperer, if you will, for the United States and help us through our transition? And my other quick question, because we haven't even talked about the Americas yet. We've both had democratic challenges uh, in our recent memories here uh, in the United States and in Brazil. Is democracy building something that we can coordinate on in a, to a deeper extent? So absolutely. And, and I mean, to the, to the first point, the United States has never really fully appreciated the fact that Brazil is the leading and only for a long time Western member of the BRICS uh, and a Western democracy in the BRICS and has over time, including during the Dilma administration, affected BRICS decisions related to Iran, BRICS decisions related to what was going on in Russia itself. And I, that was not fully appreciated in, in the United States. Uh, and by the same token, I think that the like, antipathy to OECD countries is something where Brazil could really learn and use that relationship with the United States in a, in a I think in a very valuable way for Brazil. It can play, Brazil is one of the very few countries in the world that can play in all those spaces if it chooses to. And I think that's the critical piece. And in terms of democracy, again, values are consequential. So I would just, again, on the, on the BRICS point, when Brazil was going through its election crisis, what was the rhetoric coming out of Russia and China in support of democracy in Brazil and their BRICS partner? Yeah. And, and so that's about as existential as it gets. So... Uh, and, and just in terms of the regional element, again, parallels and contradictions, one of the things that really strikes me about with Brazil is that we both tend to occasionally ignore Latin America to our respective peril. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, that took a long time to appreciate, but it's a reality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to pose just one final question before we open to our members and guests here in New York, as well as online. Um, any of you are welcome to, to answer, so, so dive right in. I know it's not a shy group. Um, in Brazil, we talk a lot about uh, you know, when a policy is a, is a state, it's a government policy. In other words, it lasts beyond political administrations. But in an era of polarization, polarization excuse me, like we talked about in the last panel, we've talked about a bit here, can you have anymore? And of the elements that we've discussed here, what do you think is the stickiest? In other words, if we're talking about Brazil's national interests in the geopolitical realm, what should remain a priority for Brazil and where can they exhibit that no matter who's president of Brazil in this environment? Maybe uh, um, I have an idea, but I thought maybe 
Oliver, would you like to dive in? Sure. Just and and this is such a, a fascinating discussion. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to um, foreign policy, um, even though Lula and Bolsonaro are fundamentally different, when it comes to how to deal with these big issues we're discussing, Bolsonaro and Lula aren't really that different. Uh, so um, Bolsonaro w- was a candidate. He was pro-Trump, anti-China. Then Biden got elected. So Bolsonaro could no longer uh, swim in the slipstream of Trump, uh, had to uh, throw out his uh, conspiracy theorist uh, foreign minister uh, and, and, and put like a centrist uh, bureaucrat. Uh, but in the end, Bolsonaro uh, realized that the only space internationally where he could show up without uh, facing uncomfortable questions about deforestation, uh, his authoritarian tendencies or uh, you know, climate denialism was the BRIC summit. Uh, you know, those were, this was a space where Bolsonaro feels comfortable. Uh, and it, so the BRICS is a very important diplomatic life raft where when things go wrong in the West, uh, you can hold on to. And this is why it's so uh, it's a it's a very attractive grouping to be part of. Um, and that's why also it's been tremendously uh, important for Russia. And I think that um, in that sense, uh, this this sort of uh, position of of being uh, flexible, non-aligned, uh, trying to keep doors open, uh, that's just a very fundamental thing. There's a there's a consensus even among bolsonaristas and pichistas that that's sort of the way that uh, Brazil should should uh, move forward. Uh, and uh, and I think that uh, that you may have you know different types of comments, but it's important to remember that five days ahead of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, who visited Moscow was Bolsonaro. And that was because Lula was giving, uh, was as a candidate, was being feted across Europe. Bolsonaro asked his foreign ministry and said, I want to be, I want to meet up with a couple of uh, rich country heads of state. Who can you uh, schedule for me? And the only ones who were willing to meet Bolsonaro was Orban from Hungary and Putin in Russia. Uh, so I think some of these things remain the same. And just very briefly to the BRICS thing, I think we'll have to wait and see. I, I tend to agree that this is a very tricky moment for Brazil. However, the benefits are still there. Uh, Putin, some people say Putin is going to invite Lukashenko and Bashir al-Assad to the BRICS summit. That would obviously be a problem for Lula. Uh, but it's important to remember that, and I agree with that with, with Ricardo, Brazil is kind of you know the United States' best bet uh, in the global south, when you compare Brazil's position on some of these key issues to those of you know other BRICS countries, and I have seen personally during BRICS meetings that the Russians pulled out a very anti-Western draft, and the Brazilian representative raised his hand and said, "This is not acceptable because we're kind of part of the West, so we don't want to be we don't want the BRICS grouping to be an anti-Western outfit." The big question now is. As uh, as Bruna said, is Brazil still capable of such a blocking minority? Because now the democracies are in the minority, and that may lead perhaps to the revival of IPSA, for example, because some of these qualms about, let's say, a more radical BRICS, anti-Western BRICS, are shared also by the Indian government. Bruna, anything to add? What elements yeah. of Brazilian policy do you see as being most sticky? Well, I think the ones are the ones where uh, Brazil has more advantage and which are the ones that we mentioned before, uh, environmental issues um, and the, the agenda where it has more technical legacy. And uh, But there is one thing I want to mention about the foreign policy uh, and how it has evolved in terms of this balance between uh, state policy and so forth. It is, it's very important to remember uh one is how the state careers were created in brazil all and including the itamarachi career and how it was somehow encapsulated over uh the years and protected from uh all those uh, chains in 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 the political hell but it we and i was i was in brazil as a public servant throughout the 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 past four or five years and I could see uh, how the public service was affected by polarization. And I think that was unprecedented. I think that um, the way where the, we saw that that uh, 
massive bureaucratic and very good and uh, educated and professional bureaucratic uh, at, the, at the federal level, bureaucratic corp, how affected they were uh, by polarization. And we saw that in an unprecedented way in, foreign, in the foreign policy career, in Itamarachi as well. Also, I want to mention that more recently, I think Brazil's approach to foreign policy has evolved extending beyond the traditional realm, realms managed by Itamarachi, now, which is the, the Minister of Foreign Relations. Now we see uh, the agendas that are very influenced by energy policy, environmental protection, economic development, and all that, not to mention, obviously, Lula's strong gravity and, and personal intentions. So I think that's very important to take into consideration. But yeah, I think the, the focus on domains where Brazil has impact and uh, its undisputed impacts, uh, such as environmental conservation, food security, transition to ener renewable energy, it's extremely important. Defending democracy, but not only the, the not only from uh, the values stand of uh, point of view, but also the delivery point of view. That's something I emphasize constantly, is that Brazil and the U.S. should uh, consider making um, a core of the bilateral relationship, the understanding of how Brazil and the U.S. can prove the world that democracies can deliver goods. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's beyond necessarily only protecting the, not only, but it's obviously the, one of the most important, but the, the electoral and the, uh, democratic institutions, but also guaranteeing that the executive can work with the other branches to deliver policies and take people out of poverty to deliver uh, the goods and the infrastructure and all the needs of the population. That's something that would be extremely important for Brazil to, to take you. the lead in that conversation. No, oh, perfect. Thank you, Brian. Well, look, I mean, there's no doubt that non-alignment is very rooted in the Brazilian sort of political soul and in its history. I, I told a story uh, several years ago. I had a conversation with uh, the former president of Brazil, Fernando Henrique Cardozo, about this topic, about the emerging tensions between U.S. and China. And, um, he, for those who don't know, he was president from 94 to 2002, a contemporary of Bill Clinton, Tony Blair. And he said, well, he said... I think we have to take advantage of one of Brazil's greatest assets, which is that Brazil is far. And because of our geographic distance, we don't really have to choose. And he said, he said, we don't have to choose yet. He says, look at what Getulio Vargas did during the 1940s, when Brazil studiously remained on the sidelines during the early salvos of World War II, and then was negotiating the whole time and did come in on the Allied side and the only Latin American country that sent troops to die in Italy. Um, but as part of those negotiations, got the capital and know-how that became the Brazilian steel industry. And that experience, I think, is still very deeply rooted in kind of the body politic. And so you hear this story in the private sector and public sector and, and beyond. And it's interesting, uh, Bruno, maybe you were referencing this, but there was a report that came out last week from the Brazilian investment bank, DTG, that was spelling out the case for, I think the, 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 the headline was, has Brazil's moment finally arrived, which, you know, set off, <laughs> it sounded Again? familiar to those Again? of us, it's cyclical, <laughs> it's cyclical, it is. By the way, that Economist cover that we all immediately think about <laughs> is now 17 years old. So the person who wrote this BTG report may have been in high school or younger when the Economist cover first came out. Think about that for Fair a moment. Enough. But they, they did list non-alignment as one of the country's strategic advantages, one of the reasons to be optimistic about Brazil's economy going forward. Whether that's true or not is kind of the question that we're all staring in the face and that I certainly don't have an answer to, because it's very possible, and we see exact concrete examples of this all the time, that by sitting on the fence, Brazil is missing out on opportunities associated with the realignment of global supply is happening right now with investments and everything from semiconductors all the way down to you know things that are would would work well with what is really Brazil or Latin America's most sophisticated industrial base. So even though Brazil is far, as Fernando Henrique Cardoso said, it's not unthinkable that they could participate in some of these shifting supply chains. But everyone senses that at least for now they're 
especially this government, they're not really into it. Like they, they like the idea and as much as it might be more investment, which might boost their popularity, but at some fundamental level, at fun, some fundamental level, uncomfortable with being too close to the United States right now. And time to tell, because I, somebody said we're in a world in transition. The thing we're all waiting for, whether it happens or not, is a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. And will that turn the world upside down? And if and when it does, will it have proven to be better to be kind of, you know, again, trying to straddle that fence or having more firmly? What, will we look back and think, oh, it would have been better to firmly align with the United States because that's the side that you're going to end up on eventually? Nobody knows. Or not. Or not. Yeah, that's or right. not. And I, final thoughts for Carter, because I know we need to go to questions. I mean, it strikes me that we've talked a little bit about everything. Personally, I'm not sure how sticky some of these things are if the right comes back in. Although, as the previous panel talked about, nobody's Bolsonaro, right? So it won't be exactly the same. But what are, what are your final thoughts? Or, or Brian, no, look, if you want to react first, no, feel free. Please, okay. no, look, just, just very, very briefly on this, because uh, I know there are good questions. So I, just very quickly, I would say, uh, you, you, you really touched on it. One of the things that I think Brazil really should stay very closely involved in is the international structures, international governance as a core uh, national interest is is absolutely vital. Uh, and uh, but it does it is going to put under strain this neutrality because it might be that Brazil's ahead of everyone. In fact, their style of diplomacy might in fact be the, the, the future. It's yeah. and, and in fact, but that also means that, for example, you know, Indonesia stayed out of that BRICS expansion. Maybe Brazil's interests are actually more there in some cases, more with India, which you know, very promptly after BRICS expansion began its own BRICS and Road. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, anyway, I think that that's a that's a really key element. Great, thank you, Ricardo. I know we've got some great questions. Um, if I could just ask for folks to identify themselves by name and affiliation, uh, and we'll start right here with the scarf. Hi, Wendy Lures, Foundation for Civil Society. This is for Ricardo. Hola. Hola. <laughs> um, with Iran particularly, but Saudi Arabia and the UAE in BRICS now, what is the US reaction because of the antipathy with Iran? And what is Brazil's relationships with the Middle East and particularly with Iran? Well, I think. For one thing, uh, one really important factor is that the Middle East has become a very important market for Brazil. Uh, Iran in particular, but Saudi Arabia as well. These are major consumers of uh, particularly agricultural goods and other commodities. Uh, but I think that the role that the Middle East and particularly the Gulf has played in BRICS expansion is really crucial. And if you're like, among other things, what the United States saw was Sure, you could say that including uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran is consistent with the idea of, of maintaining peace between those two rivals and sort of you know, creating, avoiding a disruption that would be very damaging to China from China's perspective. And that happens to benefit us that to have a peace between those two countries is uh, strategically probably a positive for the United States. The other thing is that the presence of Gulf states in the BRICS is because they needed financing for the BRICS Bank and for other endeavors of the BRICS. And that, to me, what that points to is that the world really is leveling out in a certain way. And if you say, it's, if it's true to an extent that maybe Brasilia doesn't need Washington quite as much, it also means they don't need Beijing quite as much because there are many, there's a much broader distribution of power. And I think that is actually, you know, the rise of the middle might be one of the best uh, uh, developments and phenomena for uh, Brazilian foreign policy and geopolitical ambitions that could have happened. Uh, and so if, it, if, if that is indeed a space where it can play. From the US perspective, uh, I mean, I think that yes, BRICS expansion was viewed with skepticism, particularly because of the rhetoric and the, and the way it was, it was um, sort of portrayed as being really as a counter the, not just the G7, but the West in general. I know there's been a lot of articles written about the sort of the BRICS as the future sort of counter to the, you know, the, the, the organization leading the South, it really in competition with or against the North. Uh, and I, that might be overplayed. I mean, I think to me, the one I watch in all of this is India. 
because as a as a BRICS member, what they do really, really matters. And I don't see them necessarily playing uh, the role that has been uh, that, that uh, China might hope for them. I think we've got one question online. We will take our next question from Patrick Duddy. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for doing this. Um, in, in the last few days, um, we have seen uh, developments in Haiti take um, an extraordinarily um, worrisome turn. In the past, uh, uh, Brazil has played um, uh, an important, indeed a fundamental role um, in efforts to um, uh, restore the rule of law, um, organize elections, and in general, um, improve the quality of life on the island. Um, do any of you have any insight um, into how um, Itamarachi and the, the, uh, the Lula administration views that conflict today? And um, will recent developments persuade them to take a more activist, um, uh, to assume a more activist position? Oliver, you look like you'd like to take that one. Yeah, yeah, just very quickly, and I'm sure others have actually uh, interesting things to say. Just before I answer, I just wanted to make one two-finger comment on BRICS expansion. Saudi Arabia is actually still negotiating with the United States of what it can get for not joining. So it is kind of joined, but it has actually, it's still signaling to Washington that it's willing to pull out, uh, depending on what Washington is willing to offer. So it's very, very, very pragmatic, pragmatic when it comes to, to BRICS as well. Uh, now, Haiti, I think, is, is quite interesting as an example of how Latin America as a whole uh, faces a lot of domestic uh, challenges and is actually unwilling to take a leading role in this. Brazil has had, um, you know, led the, uh, the, the minister mission in 2004, um, but now has also a very tense civil military relationship. I think there's a, a, a huge challenge for the Lula administration to assert civilian control over the armed forces as a means to stabilize uh, Brazilian democracy, which, by the way, I think is a crucial area where the United States and Brazil can work together, rather than talking in very broad terms about promoting democracy, which is very toxic in Latin America. These kinds of things, like have the U.S. military work with the Brazilian military on accepting civilian rule is, I think, perhaps uh, the best way to go about it. But I think um, uh, Latin America has been so absent from this entire debate about Haiti that we're now seeing the first uh, African um a peacekeeping mission is being led outside of Africa, uh, which I think also points to the limits of uh, the, the responsibilities Brazil is willing to take on in the geopolitical realm at this stage. Very briefly, what I've heard from Brasilia on this one is essentially boils down to don't look at us when it comes to helping with Haiti. And there's a specific interesting reason for this that has to do with domestic politics as well. There is a view, and I'm not saying, I've heard this, it's not necessarily the view, the official view of the Brazilian government, but you know, for those who don't know, the background to this was, it was Brazilian military who served as a peacekeeping force, the Minusta mission in late 2000. Yeah, uh, yeah that's right, until, until 2017. Right, so. well, the leaders of that Minusta. mission is like a who's who of some of the protagonists in the armed forces that were seen as not entirely democratic over the last couple of years. And so there's a view from the civilian leadership in Brazil that you know, to do that again might create a negative effect on domestic politics going forward because it, it was such a, a crucible for, in their view, some of the problems that came later. I'm gonna get one more question there in the back. Uh, Mike Darum of Importum. Um, Want to actually kind of follow up. Patrick's question was the first time uh, the hemisphere has been discussed here. We've talked about India, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, um, and it says a lot about Brazil that we're looking at a global scale, not a hemispheric scale. Interested to see what the panel thinks about the Brazil-Argentina relationship. Is you know integrated autos auto chains going to outweigh whatever Malay tries to do versus Lula, and then how the Brazil U.S. relationship will navigate the kind of on again off again Venezuela Guyana crisis? So, who would like to take that one? Um, let me let me jump in really quick on on Argentina 
Brazil. That's their fundamental relationship, right? And, and particularly when you're talking about jobs and union jobs, those are jobs that are producing goods that are going to Argentina. And so that's a really, what happens in Argentina is, is absolutely uh, key to what happens in, in Brazil in terms of their economic success. So I think that regardless of any divisions at the top, there is a deep ballast um, and industry in particular is the, is the source of that. And so I think that, um, I mean, look, even in the, in the Lula administration, Marco Aurelio Garcia spent an inordinate amount of time in Argentina trying to prevent the Kirchner administration from really doing damage to the Brazilian uh, economy. And, and so the, that's, a, that's the kind of thing that's, I think, more important than anything else. And in terms of Venezuela- Before and, you go to oh, Venezuela, sorry, what about Mercosur? You never even hear about oh, it. Oh, yeah. Mercosur, yeah, that was yeah. a thing. You would, you would pull up to the foreign ministry and there'd be a Brazilian flag yeah. and there'd be a Mercosur flag. I mean- that I was remember a, that guy. That was a that's thing. Right, yeah. No, it doesn't matter anymore. No, Mercosur really is under an intense strain. I think, I, I, but but what's not is like that. It as a as a vehicle for the rest of these like real genuine relationships. I think that that's um, that's uh, that's going to hold for a long time. And and I would just say uh, with regard to sort of Venezuela, Guyana, I think there was a real uh, first. There was a, a uh, you know that's a space where Brazil is a decisive player, uh, and they uh, are. You know, for a time, and I know actually, Brian, you mentioned this that you were you were. It, it was surprising how effective Brazilian diplomacy had seemed at the at the beginning. It's, but they're dealing with Nicolas Maduro and and Venezuela's domestic politics, and I think that's that's a much harder thing to manage than a, a regional dispute. I think it's very important to remember that the only way, for, the only overland route to get to Guyana from Venezuela was through Brazilian territory. So. When the Brazilian military deployed before there were any statements out of Itamarachi or Planalto, that told you all you needed to know. Like that, that's a that's a chance. The, but the, the the big problem that Venezuela that for Brazil right now is that the Venezuelan fuse just keeps burning, and that's going to be sending out people in their hundreds of thousands and millions uh, everywhere, including to Brazil. We just have a couple of minutes left, but Bruno, do you have anything to add? I think besides the migration aspect, there is the energy aspect as well that is in uh, in in um, in play when we talk about Venezuela. Um, what I think is the the and Lula just made some remarks in Venezuela, uh, meeting with Maduro uh, about um, about uh, his fear of uh, the respect of the elections by the opposition in case they lose the election in Venezuela. So I think that one of the big questions about Lula when it comes to those statements and in, in regards to Venezuela is whether or not he will keep he will be seen uh, outside of Brazil as a Democrat and defending democracy as he's seen as a, democ a democratic leader from the from the border of Brazil towards inside, so that's one of the things about it. About Haiti, I agree with uh, with what Brian just said. I think that we, what we hear in in Brasilia, and it's obviously that Brazil will be vocal as Lula was during CARICOM about the crisis, but will not necessarily uh, have any major action uh, in sending troops or something like that. Great. Well, thank you so much to everyone for your participation, to this terrific panel for the insights, and uh, looking forward to the next panel.